This is the Wally and Mathot Show. Now, here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Wallace, and he is 13-year NHL veteran defenseman and everybody's favorite partner, Mark Mathot. Meth, before we get into the show, there's a couple things that have happened south of the border. NCAA tournament hockey is going on right now. And they're setting the stage for the Frozen Four. A couple of things with Ottawa ties to tell you about. One, have a look at this. Now, we're going to show it in a sec here. Greg Carvel is the head coach of the UMass Minutemen. Their team is headed back to the Frozen Four. He's, he's done a great job with that program. But watch him as they celebrate at the end. He sprints across the ice, which I think is from basically the Zamboni Tunnel. I think this is a land speed record for the fastest <laughs> run across a sheet of ice. Yeah, that's that's bold. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked he didn't blow a tire there as he was running into that pile, but uh, good for them. He's obviously really excited. and They've done a really good job there at UMass, so I'm pumped for him. Uh, very much a lot of emphasis on that stride. Okay, let's move on now to perhaps the not-so-good news, and that's a lot of sense fans following the University of North Dakota, obviously, because they have four picks down there. But they lose, but it's in record-setting fashion, and this game, Meth, goes to five overtimes before Minnesota Duluth ends this one. 142 minutes into this game is when they finally solve the game. Here comes Minnesota Duluth. They bring it on in. And he scores! Luke Milmock inserted into the lineup. The freshman has ended it here. And Matt, that was Leah Hextall with the great call of the overtime goal. Um, what's your thoughts on seeing a game when you end up losing it in the fifth overtime? Forget about the feeling you have when you lose the game. For me, at least having experienced some, some overtime games in the past, certainly in that 2017 run we had against Pittsburgh, I think as a D-man, the first thing that runs through my mind is just don't be that guy to make a mistake. And I know the saying goes, you never play to lose but I think it's just human nature. You just don't want to be that guy to make the mistake. So I can only imagine playing that much hockey. Your legs would be jello. Your equipment would be soaking wet. And the pressure at that age would be incredible. So, you know, it's, it's a, if, if there's a good takeaway here, it would just be the learning experience for these young men. Yeah, you bring up the legs. And it's funny to say, like, the starting goalie for University of Minnesota uh, Duluth is the fact that the freshman goalie, Zach Steshkal, stopped 57 shots, but cramped up in the fourth overtime. So yeah. he gets replaced. So here's the guy sitting on the bench now for two games, and he's got to go <laughs> in and, and with a chance to go to the national championship. Like, uh, that's got to be I, – I, I, I just can't imagine what that's like as a, a young guy. Yeah, the nerves. That's, that's all I can think right now is the pressure and the nerves that are running through his veins <laughs> as he's getting the call to go in. Uh, you know, especially in that circumstance. So you got to feel for them. It's probably not the way, obviously they wanted to go out, but um, again, I, I keep emphasizing this. It's, it's nothing but learning experiences for these young guys. So, uh, you know, hats off to them. They, they've done a great job. Could, and it could be good news for Ottawa, depending on if they sign some guys here at the end, we may see a couple of these guys playing up with either Ottawa or with Belleville as this season goes on. So it might be some good news in the bad news after all, but let's move on to, you brought up playing Pittsburgh playing in overtime. So the longest you played, I think, was a double overtime game. You played 34 minutes in that game. was a career high. As you go from the first overtime to the second, what is it like? Because you guys have played in overtimes before. Going to the first one isn't that big a deal. But as it gets longer, what changes? Anything? Well, what, what made that game unique is that it's game seven. So this isn't game three overtime. This is yeah. game seven. So it's an elimination situation. Um, you know, in between periods, I still remember it vividly just sitting there in that Pittsburgh uh, visiting locker room. You're, you're soaked, right? So all I'm doing, being a bigger guy, and I sweat like crazy. So I'm trying to change out all my socks. I'm taking my skates off. I'm changing my shirt. Everything that you could think of. We've all got our equipment on the glove dryer where it's just this little mechanism that dries your gear. So we're all fighting for space on that and, you know, electrolytes, Gatorade, all that stuff. So um, nerves aren't really in play at that point until you get maybe back on the ice and you're back in that game like situation. But if you're playing lots and you're in it, you're not really thinking about all that stuff. It's just everything second nature and you're relying on your instincts. So, um, it never really affected me in any negative way other than obviously when that goal goes in and your dreams come crashing down. <laughs> Fair enough. But is it, is it quiet? Is the room more quiet yeah, than normal? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you're going to get the guys that are the vocal players, I should say, that are chiming in initially when you get in the room. 
you know, trying to cheer guys up and, you know, great job, boys, let's keep going. But it's definitely a lot more quiet than it normally is just because everyone's exhausted at this point. Right. And then the coaches come in usually around that eight minute mark prior to going back out and they give you a little bit of a speech, but this whole time you're in your own head at this point uh, in the season, you already know what your role is out there and what you have to do. And you just kind of keep to yourself and you go out and do the job. Okay. Well, we'll try not to keep you for any extra time today uh, so that you can get your electrolytes in you, but let's move on and talk about this show. It's a big show episode number seven. So we figured we should have number seven of the Ottawa senators. So Brady Kachuk is stopping by for a good chat. We're going to catch up with him, see how his season is going along. Also stopping by Andre Turney, the head coach of the Ottawa 67s. He signs an impressive one-year deal to coach with Hockey Canada, something I don't remember ever being seen done before. And also, we've got uh, Craig is going to stop by and bring us the You Want Answer segment that uh, has become an internet sensation, of course. And then we've got Trivial Trivia presented by our good friends at gongshow.com. And yes, we have secured another sauce off kit to give away. So we'll get to all that in just a moment. But first... Let's get to the headlines, shall we? In a number one, Christian's crossroads. After clearing waivers, where does Christian Willannon go from here? All-star selection. Beth, who is your Ottawa Senator all-star for this year if there, was, if there was to be a game? Installed. What does trading for Eric Stahl do for the Montreal Canadiens and their playoff run? Fight to the finish. How will the top four teams in the North finish in the standings? And fortunate 500. Daryl Sutter with a beauty chirp on Johnny Hockey's milestone game. Although I'm not sure if Johnny Hockey thought the same thing. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, Christian's crossroads, Matt. What now for Christian Willannon, who was placed on waivers on Friday? The guy's played 15 games this year. It looked like he was going to be a top six guy, perhaps, to start the year. Now it looks like his future is very uncertain with the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, it's, it's disappointing. You know, I, I know that a lot of us had high hopes. Um, for Christian going into the season and obviously it's not the end of his road you know he still has an opportunity moving forward but to me I know he's just such a likable person I know a lot of media guys really like him he's open he's candid he's very confident he's a good interview so selfishly I think a lot of us wanted to see him succeed but um, I think at the end of the day it just comes down to losing that coach's trust right he's a fantastic skater he moves the puck very well he creates a lot of space for him out there when he does have the puck on transition, which I always stress. And it came down to those little breakdowns in the D zone. And I don't know if it was just a lack of maybe strength around his net, around net front, losing battles here and there, and then maybe trying to do a little too much on the occasional rush that he'd have the puck. And, you know, ultimately it would lead against, you know, in a goal against. These are all things that contribute to that. And as a coach, I mean, you got to be able to trust your players. And if you don't think that guy's going to give you the best chance to win the game, you're not going to put him out there. And Christian's 26 years old. So what's next for Christian Willannon? Well, there are arguments to be made there. I think he's probably going to go into the offseason, hopefully have some good reps, first of all, down in Belleville. Yeah. Have a very good attitude. Just, you know, leave a good taste in everyone's mouth moving forward that they, you know, in their memory of Christian Willannon with the organization. But more importantly, Depending on what, the, what kind of looks he gets here at free agency, if nothing really pops up and he can't get a one way, I, I don't know that visiting the European option is a bad idea for him. He's such a great skater. He'd do really well overseas. Now, I'm not trying to gloss over the fact that, you know, his hopes and dreams have crashed here as an Ottawa Senator or that he won't be playing in the NHL anymore. There's still a chance, but I'd like to see what he could do overseas. I think he could make a lot of noise, particularly now at his age, being that he's a little older. All right, but I, we go through this question, I think, with Logan Brown, and people say, well, you got to give him a chance to play to see if he can do anything. So he's played 15 games this year. Have yep. you seen enough of a sample size to say, you know what, Christian Milan is not good enough for us? I'm not sure that you've seen a big enough sample size. And going back before that, he played 30 games before yep. he got hurt going to that training camp, and people thought, you know, top four. So really, has he fallen that much? Like, what is it that's so glaring that – Braden Coburn and other guys are doing so much better. Well, that's a question that I've asked too, because I'm always, I'm always curious as to, you know, what a coach is thinking and why, why does he just not agree with the way Christian's been playing or what's yeah. he seeing that we're missing? And, you know, I, to me, it's pretty obvious. It comes down to the D zone play and he's made some high risk plays in the past and he's lost battles here and there. And, you know, when you're under the gun and, and, and you've lost that confidence in your coach, everything's going to be, under the microscope, right? So every little mistake you make is going to be glaring. Everyone's going to be talking about it. And then puts a lot of stress on the coaching staff to perhaps bring in a new player. So you're right. We've had a small sample size of what he's able to do at this level, but 
I mean, from an organizational standpoint, I think at this point, you just have to move on because you can't, you know, you brought up Logan Brown. You can't compare him to Logan Brown. He's 26. He's had his opportunity, his opportunities, excuse me, to come in and out of the lineup and show what he can do. And at the end of the day, it's up to the player and that individual to make some noise and he hasn't done it. All right, fair enough. So let's move on then to who you do like uh, with the Ottawa Senators. <laughs> who, there is no All-Star game this year, but if there was, who is it that you're sending to the All-Star game to represent the Ottawa Senators? Now, I'm worried to answer that question because I don't know who you have up your sleeve, but I'm going to go with Thomas Shabbat. Only because, to me, if you look at the most valuable player on this team, I can't think of another player. This this kid plays 40 minutes a night. Um, we all know what the team looks like without him in the lineup, and it's not pretty. There's an argument to be made. Maybe Brady's an option. I'm not sure who you're going to pick, Wally, but for, for me, ultimately, it is Thomas. I mean, you look around the league right now, and, and I think as far as having a representative come in and represent the Ottawa Senators, I don't know that we have any forwards that can fill that role right now, uh, depending on what format you want to use. So for me, it's, it's, it's a no brainer. It's Thomas Shabbat. And I'm curious to see who you pick. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm sitting here biting my tongue going, are you real? Like, are you, is because he's a defenseman and you guys just stick together in your little club. <laughs> well, but what maybe. I don't get is how you don't pick Brady Kachuk. A, he's on the show today, but B is yeah. he leads the team in points, leads uh, tied for goals. Uh, he leads the league and I think it's still shots and hits and trying to become the first player sure. ever to do that. Like, yeah. what more do you need from somebody to okay. not pick him as the all-star representative? He's the best player on this team. Okay. I was waiting for you to stop there. I want to chime in. I don't know if I can. I've got so much more. Go on. <laughs> okay. No, no, just, I'll make one quick point then. If you look at the most recent all-star format, you can only have seven D men from the division, two defensemen and two goaltenders, right? So right now, and I've, I'm cheating a little because I had these written down. I don't want to make any mistakes here. Up front with your forward group, you've got McDavid, Matthews, Dreisaitl, Shifley, Besser, Ehlers, Toffoli. And there's, I'm sure there are some more notable guys that you could add in there. But like, I don't know that Brady is better than those players right now. And then, up, you know, on defense, you've got Petrie and maybe Quinn Hughes. And there's a couple other notable guys in there, I'm sure. But I mean, to me, if you're going to have to pick one Ottawa Senator, it's Thomas Shabbat and your pick. I mean, the argument I just made basically buries yours. Would you agree? No, I, I disagree with you. <laughs> I, I just think if you look at the numbers that Thomas Shabbat has put up. Yeah, yeah. Then I, right you, ha you have to find a way to put Brady Kachuk on the all-star team. But I just got a text. Yeah. Uh, the interview is over. Uh, Brady will not be on the show. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for that. Fair enough. Um, fair enough. Yeah, and, and my and guess is... Continue, I was going to say, you make a really good point. And, and it's really hard because we're talking about a team that's in dead last right now. So the numbers aren't very sexy statistic wise on all, on all the guys. So to me, I'm just picking the most valuable player on our team right now. To me, yeah. it's, it's Thomas Shabbat. Well, my guess is if you were a goalie, you would have picked all the goalies as well. So uh, we'll just move <laughs> on. All right. All right. <laughs> Let's get to installed. And that is the, uh, Montreal Canadiens trade for Eric Stahl. They don't have to give up much to get him. They get a third and a fifth to get him out of Buffalo. Even Buffalo eats some of the contract. I don't have a problem yeah. with this move, but does it help them in the postseason here? I mean, how does it not help them? Montreal has nothing to lose here. This is low risk for them. So Bergevin does a great job picking him up, in my opinion. In my experience playing against Stahl, I mean, he's a fantastic role player on your team. He'll probably start off as your fourth line center, but honestly, I could see him moving up that depth chart, depending on his play. He's incredibly reliable on draws. He's very strong on the walls. He's got a very good net front presence. I mean, those are ideal traits to have on your fourth line and he'll drive that line and make it depth wise, just very reliable going into your postseason. So I love that team as a whole. Um, you know, I think they're just creeping in right now, coming in through that back door. They've got games at hand on people. That's another story, but yeah, as far as stall goes, I mean, how do you not love this move? I, I think it's great. And it's like I said, it's low risk. They, they've eaten half his salary. Well, that's it. And people seem to think that he's, you know, he's got what, 10 points this year that he's really struggling. But if you go look back and team. look, well, that's what I'm like his last yeah. four seasons, if they didn't come to an end earlier, he would have had, I think his fourth straight 20 goal season. Like the guy, I think right. he still play regardless of being 36. And when you look at what Jason Spetz has done in that fourth line role as a high end center, yeah. It looks really good. Like, that's what I kind of think that that role is made for him right now 
is to look like the Jason Spezza role where you can still have offense, smart guys. You can put them out to be win draws, all that. I, I, I like the move, I think. Yeah, I like that comparison. I agree. So to me, it comes down to the situation the team's in. And you've got a team here that's got a lot of good role players. There's an argument to me. They, they made some, some older acquisitions. They brought Perry in, for example. But yeah. I think Stahl's another... It's just a different animal. You can bury him on your fourth line if you have to, but he's a role guy. He, he'll he'll be great on draws. I don't want to keep repeating myself, but yep. just a big, strong guy to have in your lineup that can score. He's got he's got scoring touch. It's perfect. Okay. Here's the only question I have about Montreal, and that is, are they too old as a group? Uh, they, now they just add another guy who's 35 plus. I'm just curious yeah. in the postseason if that starts to wear down, or do they know how to take care of themselves that perhaps they're a little bit better because they know what it takes to win? Yeah, in an 82-game season, you might have an argument there, and that would probably have weight. But it's a shortened year right now. I think veteran leadership, I always stress that, but I think having yeah. good vets right now that, that are hungry, like Stahl's a guy that wants to win. You've got guys that are highly motivated in a great little market there. I think it'll only work out in their benefit. Because I know from postseason experience, as an older player, you're just more confident. You're more comfortable. You're less you know, stressing these games. You know what to expect. Um, you know how to handle the pressure a little bit better. So I think it'll work to their benefit. And that's definitely a team to watch out for. All right. Well, speaking of that team, let's go to fight to the finish. And that is, I want you to tell me now how the top four teams are going to finish in the North division. I think it's pretty clear who they're going to be. I don't think you're going to see Vancouver, Calgary, or Ottawa in there. And in fact, the bottom three teams in that division have all played the most games going into yeah. Monday night. So what is it that, uh, how will this all play out for you in the top four? I mean, you, there, you could argue that it'll be a complete crapshoot, but I, lo I, I love the way Montreal is trending right now. They've got games at hand on, any, and on everybody, excuse me. And I just find that team incredibly intriguing right now. I, I feel like they've kind of not been playing up to their level for a little while there. And if they can kind of hit a heater, get some solid goaltending out of price moving forward in Allen, I mean, there's no telling what they can do. I do think that you'll see maybe a little bit of team shuffling in that top four, but, um, and we've had these discussions in the past. I think when it comes down to it, the division right now is set in stone. You're not going to see a whole lot of change. Again, you might see a little fluctuation in those top four teams, but those four teams I think are cemented going into that postseason. So I'm sorry, Calgary fans. I don't see a whole lot of hope in that team. Okay. So give me the top four. How, who finishes first, second, third, and fourth? Well, I like, I like, <laughs> Uh, I'm reluctant to say this. No, because we're going to save this and we're going to bring it up. I know, at the end of I the know. Year. And then it's going to be used against me, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm leaning on Montreal finishing first. I wow. like where they're heading right now. Yes. And then maybe have Toronto fall back into that second spot. Edmonton's playing really well right now. I could see them falling up around number three spots. So again, I, I, I'm hoping we can burn this tape at some point, but no. To me, so you, Montreal's... Just, you just put Winnipeg in fourth, right? <laughs> I know, I know. And, and they were, and I'm flip-flopping here and I understand that, but they were, to me, they were like a dark horse of mine maybe a month ago, but I just love these Montreal moves that they made. And if they can figure things out, they will be the team to beat here out of the North. Okay. All right. So I'm going to debate this with you because Montreal, Please. they were playing really well going into this little, yep. uh, I guess, COVID shutdown, if you will. So they were, I think, five three and seven in their last 15 games. Fairly good, right? Picking up points. But the problem yeah. is they've got this now long break. How do you come out of this break and start to pick it up where you left off? I think that is a big question mark for them. Now, right. Toronto has 13 away games left and eight at home. Mm -hmm. They do have six games remaining against Montreal. So I think that's huge for them. I don't know that Toronto can finish first based on the away games. And I think if Montreal gets hot, then they can affect Toronto. Edmonton's got 10 home games, but five of their last seven games are on the road. I think if they struggle on the road there, you'll see them perhaps sit right where they're at in third. Mm -hmm. And Winnipeg, I think that people forget about Winnipeg. One, they've got Connor Hellebuck, who's the reigning best in trophy winner. Yeah, 11, yeah. 11 home games and eight of the last 11 are at home. Five games against Ottawa. They went four and one this season. I think Winnipeg finishes first and then it's Toronto, Montreal and Edmonton. And when you tell me that, I like that. That's the problem here. <laughs> but I'm going to stay firm on my prediction. Again, it, to me, two, three, and four are a toss-up. It all depends on scheduling, like you just mentioned, but more, more or less just how they handle these last, well, this yep. last little stretch that they're going into. But 
I like being bold and I love the conversation that we had with, with Kevin Bieksa, one of, you know, friend of the show. He's a big fan of Montreal and I like the way he explained it. I, I just, to me right now, it's, it's, it's up for grabs, but it's Montreal to lose and they've got games at hand on everybody. So I think they can run away with it. I'm going to stick with that. I don't really care right now. <laughs> well, and you've proven already in the show to be wrong. So this isn't going to come as any surprise. All right. <laughs> Well, we'll move on to number five and then wrap this up with fortunate 500. And that is so head coach of the flames. Daryl Sutter is asked in the morning skate about Johnny Goudreau playing in his 500th game, this milestone game. Here's what he had to say. Johnny plays Johnny Goudreau plays 500 games tonight at the NHL level. I'm just wondering, you know, mostly as a guy who's coached against him and now working with him, what, uh, what have your kind of impressions been of the career he's made so far? And and then what are you looking to see out of him now at this point? Well, if you're just basing on his 500th game tonight, hopefully he has more energy than in his 499th game. So let me get this straight. He just calls out Johnny Goudreau, who's struggling to say the least about hopefully he's going to be a little bit better in his 500. Is he an expert motivator? Or is he playing some mind games with his forward? Well, that's a tough one because we all know how Daryl Sutter is, right? He comes in with the pedigree, but also a reputation that he's very forthright and honest, brutally honest at times. Mm -hmm. And he'll give it to you straight no matter who you are on the team. Now, having said that, might have been maybe a little better to at least acknowledge the milestone, at least after he made that comment. (laughs) But he (laughs) he stood firm with that blank look on his face. Kind of goes to show how frustrated he might be in the moment there. and But I think as a coach, obviously, you have to make the distinction uh, when someone reaches a certain milestone in, in their career that they deserve a little bit of a, a stick tap for that. But again, you know, the old heads are going to suggest that, well, the new age guys are soft and they should be able to handle the criticism. And then the more modern day fan might suggest otherwise that, you know, there needs to be a little bit of sensitivity involved. So I'm maybe a little bit in between. I think that, uh, you know, you can make that comment as a joke, but at least acknowledge the milestone after the fact and then move on. Well, yeah, Brian Murray was, I think, classic at that when he was the head coach with Ottawa or even the GM. If you'd ask him, he'd have some sarcastic response, but then he'd probably follow it up with, you know what? Good for him. It's always nice to see players reach milestones, whatever. But I guess you played with a few guys uh, as coaches. Did you ever see any kind of stuff like that as you were playing? I mean, I played for Hitch. Ken Hitchcock. Would be <laughs> I didn't want to brutal. say it by name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he's had some big battles when I've been exposed to some stuff like that. I, I, I mean, forget him just yelling and, and screaming at certain players on the bench to get them going. And the players would bark back. And, you know, Hitch would be like, good. That's what I want. You know, like he, 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 he'd get that out of a guy. And that was how he motivated players. And, um, you know, it doesn't always work with everybody. And certainly we've had run-ins where I believe Hitch walked out at uh, practice we had in Ottawa and the players had to run practice. I remember Adam Foote skating around the ice with a a whistle around his neck, blowing drills down. So, you know, and, and I loved Hitch, you know, I love playing for him. He's one of my favorite coaches that I ever played for. And we got along great. So it all comes down to the individual and what you can handle as a player. And I don't know that, That is very acceptable nowadays. I think things are kind of gravitating towards a different approach, a newer age style of coaching. But, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. And that's kind of the way it was back in the day. And I think Sutter is kind of bringing that old school mentality back. And maybe not everybody's really used to that anymore. Yeah, you just kind of glossed over the fact that Adam Foote is running a practice with a whistle. Okay, so (laughs) let's just back this up for a second. Now, where is Hitch at this point? And why aren't the assistant coaches running practice? Uh, they all walked out. Well, Hitch, Hitch brought them all off the ice because we were doing very well. And um, and I think Hitch had it out with, with Pekka for a little bit on the ice. And I'm not talking about the current Pekka. I was talking about his dad. And um, yeah, it just I guess the guy, they had a big argument on the ice or just prior. And Hitch said, you know, you guys do it yourself. And he pulled a bike up to the, to, to the boards and watched us on the stationary bike as he was spinning. And just watch practice. And he was snickering a little and did his thing. But again, you have to respect him for it because he stayed first, stood firm uh, on his beliefs that he didn't have to be out there and walked off. And we ran a practice and that was the end of it. It was fun. Did you win the next day? 
You know, it's funny. I don't remember. I couldn't tell you, but Hitch was still around for a long while after that. So, you know, that's his philosophy. And, um, you know, we, we weren't that bad, but we were struggling at the time. And sometimes you need a good kick in the butt to get going. And that was one of them. Uh, by the end of the show, I'm going to have to try and look this up and see if you did win the game. All right. But we got to take a break for now. We got plenty coming up in the show. Andre Turney's going to stop by. We got Craig coming by with You Want Answers. And of course, we've got Trivial Trivia presented by gongshow.com, of course, giving away a sauce off kit. But next, up after the break, we have a chat with number seven. And of course, my all star selection, Brady Kachuk. Don't want to go anywhere. You're watching the Walling the Thought Show. All right, welcome back to the show. And for episode seven, we need number seven. So we got the one and only Brady Kachuk to join us on this show. Brady, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Listen, your team right now has got points in five straight games. I figured out why you've been so successful. You get to have six players on the ice at all times, it appears. It's crazy. I, I remember looking back, I'm like, there's just way too many guys out here right now. But I really think the good luck charm, seeing your guys is freaking faces and practice and games <laughs> and stuff. So see you guys, it, we got a hot start from that. Yeah. Was anybody saying anything on the bench when you had the six players on the ice? Because you don't want the liney to hear anything, right? Yeah. I, I remember we, the face off blew and like the whistle blew. And then all of a sudden I see like 4D come on the ice, to like make it like a, oh, we're going to make this a subtle change. Everybody's like, get on the ice. <laughs> like, so there's a lot of guys. I was like, all right. Like, I guess we did have a lot of guys out here. So we, gotta, we definitely got away with that one. Uh, are you a member of the Sen Sickos? You know what? I gotta like look more into it. I see all the the you know the pictures and the signs and stuff. I know like a little bit about it, but I don't know quite how it started. But I mean that they play the yes and the ha 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 pretty much all game. You know, after every whistle or before each you know start of the period. So I mean, I think it's hilarious. But I definitely gotta you know know more and and uh, do my research. And what was your reaction when you skated by and saw? meth uh cardboard cutout you know what that's i think i saw a tweet that ever since you guys put your you know picture and your faces up there we we were five six game winning streak or point streak so as long as it stays up there and we keep going uh uh, no we'll take it we're we're happy with it you're welcome by the way it's our our little (laughs) gift to you yeah perfect brady what are you guys even doing so i i just i need to know this like what's the day-to-day now uh, you're obviously living with a couple other the fellas i think you're with you're with norris and stutzler right so what do you guys yeah. do every day when you're not playing yeah well i've never been a, or i've never met a guy who loves sleeping more than timmy he's sleeping all the time just <laughs> i don't know what it is he loves his naps josh is does his own thing no it's been great though we've got a great dynamic here we we have time to ourselves, but then, you know, always for dinner and we're always watching games together. So it's been, it's been a blast. Okay. So are you guys gaming at all or anything like that? We were at the start, but not, not much anymore. We're watching, there's a lot of TV shows and different stuff like that. Just a lot of shooting the um, shit. I don't know if I could say that here, but it's just a lot of, <laughs> you can say whatever you want. It's all yeah, a, lot of, a lot of guy time, a lot of just, just a lot of hanging out. It's been fun. Yeah, in Columbus, when I started off, same situation as you guys. We had a whole bunch of young guys living in the same building. We leave all our doors open. We all lived in the same hallway. And you'd hear F-bombs and everything up and down the hall all the time. And we'd get complaints. Anyway, I was curious because of the COVID and everything. I'm sure you guys are stuck inside, right? So who's so who's doing all the cooking? No, Josh is a great cook. Josh is cooking okay. for us. A lot of takeout, though. And uh, <laughs> Jim, Jimmy and I provide nothing to the table. We just – we fake clean – Jimmy's a mess, so it's no, it's been good. Honest. Okay. Yeah, Josh does. Let's be honest, Josh does all the work. We just sit there and act like we're you no know, helping him out, but he does everything. So, what's Josh's go-to meal for you guys? Hmm. I think the only thing we've had with him are steak, sweet potatoes, and asparagus. That's like our our norm. That's it. Sounds That's good. good. That's actually he's, he's dialed in. No, it's, it gets better every time. So, um, no, that's pretty much all we have. Uh, the two of them. Well, Josh says he can speak German. So, do they speak German around you? Have you learned any German? Ah, uh, huh. I know a little bit. <laughs> Nothing crazy. Just know probably a couple of them. But they like they just make fun of me in German. I can't do anything about it. So it's like the worst <laughs> thing in the world. So they're just laughing the whole time. And Josh. 
don't know if he's speaking the proper German, but Timmy just laughs at everything. So I think you just do, give him a bunch of courtesy laughs. Uh, speaking of Timmy or Jimmy Stu, as you like to call him, is uh, one of the games between you and your brother, he skates over, uh, he says something to Matt, and then he skates away. And then the next game, he skates over and Matthew leaves. So I'm just curious, what is Jimmy saying in the three seconds that he's stopping by? He just... <laughs> It was hilarious. I saw him in the corner of my eye and all he says is, hey, but he's got like, of course, the accent. He's like, hey, brother. And just like, I was crying, laughing. And, and like Matthew just got up and skated away. But I don't know why I thought it was the funniest thing ever. But now it's, uh, well, our routine there is just both of us just stretch there. So it looked like uh, it looked like it changed a little, though, right? Eventually, like, so it started off, you guys were kind of giggling and laughing amongst yourselves. And then obviously, eventually it just got more and more serious as every game went on. Is that just like something you guys realized, okay, shit, we better start being a little more professional or does it even matter? That's the yeah, well, Matthew one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think with, uh, with Daryl too, you know, the new coach, it's uh, doesn't matter family or not. It's uh, it's a business out there. So I think yeah. right when you now he was named coach, they're playing us. So he's like, we can't be stretching and talking like we were before. So this is all, yeah all business. I was like, all right. So Timmy took over and now Timmy and I just kind of hang out and, and laugh a little bit and, and just <laughs> solve world's world's issues. Uh, yeah. I guess when it comes to the Sutter family, there are, there are no friends for sure. Um, there is one video caught of you after you fought uh, Ben Sherratt in the penalty box and Jim sk- skates by, I gotta call, stop calling him Jimmy. Tim <laughs> skates by and start the two of you start chuckling with each other, um, which was caught on camera. And it's really funny video. I'm just curious uh, did you know exactly what he's talking or laughing about as you guys make eye contact? Yeah, I had no clue why he was laughing to begin with. I just was like, <laughs> man, I'm sitting here for five minutes. Like, I'm, I'm tired. Like, I can't have this guy laughing at me right now. So I try and hide <laughs> as much as I can. And then uh, he told me after, he's like, I was like, uh, like why, are you, why were you crying laughing? And he's like, bro, I didn't realize how tough you were. And I was like, <laughs> really? That's, that's what you're laughing at that whole time? I was like, oh, geez. That's pretty good. Speaking of tough, um, this show actually I enjoy because it makes me feel like Matt is a little bit older than we want to lay, maybe let on because he actually played against your dad. So um, that's one of the fun things I get to have now with Matt being 35 and a little bit older and I don't feel so old. So what uh, Matt is it like to play against the Keith Kachuk? Uh, you know what? He was still a, obviously a full-time NHLer when I was a call-up, so I didn't get to see him a ton, but I still remember one game. And your old man probably won't remember because I was an absolute pigeon at this point. I was just a rookie. But I took a run at him in St. Louis in an exhibition game in the neutral zone, and he stood me up like I hit a brick wall. I didn't realize how heavy he was. <laughs> so I took a run at him, and he just kind of gave me a dirty look and shoved me back, and a bunch of his buddies came in and kind of went after me after the whistle, and that was it. That's my Keith Kachuk story. <laughs> That's it ends amazing. There, but, but, yeah, like, it's crazy. When I'm looking at him, I'm talking to you right now, and I'm like, I played against his old man. Like, it's just it's strange for me. It's a tra- strange adjustment. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's a brick wall out there. I, was, I can't imagine. Have you ever played like Keith one on one on the ice? Just I don't know. In the last couple of years, like I'm just curious if he's still that entire horse strength of a man. Yeah, I think the last time I skated with him, it was right before the Blues alumni game, or like the Winter Classic. Where I, I forget what year it was, but when they played Chicago. I was home for Christmas. I was at the U S program at the time and came home and I skated with him for just like a little game. And I thought it was great. It's, it's, yep. He still just goes to the net and comes right off. So that's just you know how he played back in the day and how he still was. So it was good. Yeah. It was fun. On that note, I, I wanted to ask you this. So you and your brother are both like, you know, hard nosed players. You play with a lot of sandpaper. Where does that come from? Obviously your dad, played very hard. I'm aware he's had over 2000 penalty minutes, but that doesn't always kind of translate into their, their kids, right? Like Domi's pretty skilled. I know he can handle himself, but not necessarily a hard nose sandpaper type of player like you and your brother. Where does that come from? Well, I think obviously the, the easy ones from not just from my dad and how he played, but I think it's, yeah. you know, Mazzy, I just growing up, it's just, we've always been battling, and always competing. He, he never took, he never made life easy for me. He is, no matter what we were doing, he was going all out himself. And obviously he was so much bigger and stronger than me growing up. So he'd always win. So I just think 
you know, the battle and the compete between us just growing up. I think that's what created that, that we hate to lose. And, and, uh, you know, I always lost growing up and, and you know, he was always used to winning. So I just think that once we got older, it got way more competitive and, um, no, it was good. I think that's, I think that's what really helped us to kind of have that, you know, little edge and, and play on that edge and, um, do anything to win. Nice. Yeah. A lot of people I should, uh, on the internet, we've seen people talk. They want to see perhaps the two Kachucks play on the same team together. And I know you can't comment on that, but my question would be, could two Kachucks survive together on the same team? <clears throat> hmm, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I would like to think so. Uh, that That's probably the proper answer. I mean, it would be pretty cool and, um, yeah, play similar. So it definitely be some fun games to watch as a fan. I can tell you that it's always going to be something happening. So Matt, my question then to you would be, which one of the two brothers would you want to face for one game with every shift? Uh, well, his brother slew footed me when I was playing in Dallas and I chased him into a pile. That, that's not, that would never happen. So not, I didn't not. like him particularly. I remember grabbing your brother's hair, I think in the pile. But I mean, he was defenseless because I kind of jumped him. Uh, <laughs> and I really like Brady's play just because I'm obviously a Sens fan. So, but they're both, I, I don't want to pin one against the other. They're both great players. I love the way you guys both play. That's why I'm asking you all these questions. But I'd have to, I'd have to go with Brady. He's a little younger and uh, captain material here in Ottawa. So it'll be interesting to see. But that would be my answer. And again, I don't like your brother just from experience on the ice. With <laughs> uh, a lot of people could say that too. <laughs> Not the first time you've heard that for sure. Um, you have a chance, as you know, to lead the league in hits and in shots. I'm just curious if you pay any attention to it. Yeah, I mean, I know people brought that up last year about, you know, potentially being the first person, uh, you know, 300, 300. I mean, that would have been, of course, looking back, that would have been pretty cool. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think just the way I play, I mean, I get a lot of those shots and rebounds. But, of course, I'd like more goals and, and have more, more of those go in. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's – it's a short year. So I try to put everything on the line every single night and have no regrets uh, looking at it uh, after the year. All right. I don't want to negotiate your contract, but I do want to ask you one question as you become a restricted free agent at the end of the year. And that is, does the losing matter or affect how you negotiate your contract coming up as you've, I think have 62 wins here in 178 games since you've joined the Sens. Yeah. I mean, you look at our team and, and you just see a ton of unbelievable talent coming up. That's already, you know, with our team or, or guys, you know, in college and juniors overseas, there's a ton of unbelievable players here and, and we're going to have a bright future. We have, you know, great pieces already. So, um, you know, to be honest, you haven't really thought about, you know, the contract stuff because, you know, just want to put ourselves in the best position moving forward this year and focus on every day, you know, individually, collectively, just getting better and, and becoming that playoff team that we know we can be. And, um, you know, it starts the hard work we have to put in every single day. So um, try to try to lead by example by doing that. And, and you no, know, it's been great that the team's improved this much through you know, the, these last couple of months. And, and uh, I, I feel like we've, we've taken a lot of steps this year and it's just going to uh, keep continuing. It looks like it's fun. Um, and that's always tough sometimes to do when you're in a losing situation. But when, on a nightly basis, it seems like there's a lot of fun that you guys have with each other. Uh, is it a pretty tight group? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be probably the tightest group that I've been on. No, probably in the NHL. It's, it's been it's been a blast. Every so it's just been everybody just loves coming to the rank. Everybody loves hanging out. There's a lot of a lot of times that we're at, at the rank way longer than we should be after practice practices after games. And so, um, you know what, we're having a blast. And, and um, like you said, I think it's showing that, you know, with the way we, we play, it's we leave it all out there every single game. And um, it, it's not just a couple, it's everybody. So um, it's been a blast going into each game with everybody. Okay. I'm going to trivia question for you. In the last three years, you've played with nine goalies to start. Uh, for your team, I'm just curious if you can name all nine goaltenders. All nine. So we got Craig Anderson, Check. Mike Condon. Yep. We've got Matt Murray, Anders Nielsen, Mike McKenna, this is good. Hogberg. 
and we got Gustafson, and we got Forsberg. You're missing one. That was impressive, though. He, he played one. this year. Oh, of course. There you oh, go. Yeah. There you go. Well that done. Was actually really, yeah, that was actually really good. <laughs> we didn't Points think you'd of- get that right. <laughs> <laughs> I never doubted you, Brady. I was, I, it's Mark that always <laughs> doubts you. Um, so <laughs> back to – Five uh, more trivia because I remember I, had, I was very, very bad in the first trivia we did with, uh, with you, Wally, the first year. I knew <laughs> nothing. True. Okay, so our, I do have one I found interesting. Who has more points since you joined the NHL, you or Thomas Shabbat? Shabby. Do you know by how many? So he had. Oh, I had to do a quick little math in my head here. Oh, yeah, that's tough. We're putting <laughs> we're putting him on the spot now. He he just asked. I say. I, it's I say five to eight. Wow, it's four points. Oh, that's close. Yeah, you might ha- you might catch him by the end of the year. We'll see. He's been playing good, so he's been he's been leading us. So it's been fun to watch him play. Uh, quickly, uh, if you if you were to teach Pierre Dory and your general manager how to properly throw a water ball, because you guys on the bench you get a little wound up, you break sticks, you throw some water bottles. What would be your advice to him after last night's incident? I don't know if I should comment on this one. That's uh, <laughs> I'm Wally, already... Wally's just I'm trying to sewer me, so I'm keep my mouth shut for this one. <laughs> I, just I had no idea that one was coming either. <laughs> just thought I would. I thought I'd bring it up. It was a good uh, try. I respected anyway. it. You've seen the video, I'm assuming. Yeah, I see it. It was, uh, okay. it was a good throw. Okay. All right. We'll move on. Um, one of our favorite uh, questions that we have here on the little show is favorite snack. Do you have a particular cheat snack you like to go to? Oh, there's a ton of those. Oh man. I, I don't know if I have, there's nothing wrong with like Tostitos chips. Like that's, there's nothing wrong with that's a nice little snack. <laughs> dip. You got to have like the, but the dip too, right? Yeah. Salsa? All, all yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. A little salsa, a little, little guac. So it's, it's all good. We're all happy. Nice. Nice. Guac, I think guac's healthy. Yeah, yeah. You gotta look at the positives. You gotta tell Schwartzy that I got guac, so we're all good. <laughs> all right. Um, do you have musical taste? This isn't more meth's wheelhouse, but I'm curious if you were to pick the three first warm up songs for your team, what would they be? Well, my favorite song that always gets me going is Mr. Brightside. So that's gotta be one. Um, uh, big Elton John fans, so like a rocket man. Nice. And that, and then, uh, <laughs> the third one, that kind of just depends on how I'm feeling. I could go from, you no know, cold play, go loud luxury, it's you go, you know, a country singer. So there's, there's just a range of different things for the third one. That's I'm, wow. imp- I'm impressed. I, I like younger guys like Brady right now. Like, I feel like you guys are all listening to a lot of like, uh, EDM and like some certain like like poppy rap stuff, but your list your your name like Elton John. That's that's impressive for your age. Yeah, no, I like Elton. It's it's it was able to go to a concert and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, so it was good. Awesome. That was Vancouver or something, right? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it was Vancouver. What's the one concert you'd like to get to that you haven't yet? <laughs> There's a list of those. I I would I gotta go with. Coldplay. I know this might be crazy too. I, I gotta I feel like I gotta go to a, an Adele concert. She she would be great. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Nice. Didn't expect that answer. No. Okay. Meth, will you will you take them? Now. What's that? Will you take them then? Will you take them to Adele? Would you go? I'm not an Adele. My, my wife's seen Adele uh, and claims that Adele has like sung to her like in front of everybody because she was like front row. <laughs> So apparently they had a moment, but I would, that's not for me. I'm more like metal and rock. I like the old stuff like Elton John too and Coldplay, but Adele's kind of, I, I don't know why we're talking about Adele right now. <laughs> because <laughs> we're just having some fun. Uh, yeah. So he, here's a question, Brady, of all your teammates, and you are stuck on a deserted island. One mm. of them is sent to rescue you. Who is that teammate? Sent to rescue me. Because there's no and question just, you'd probably take Jimmy to sit with you on the beach because he'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Who yeah, has I the need best to know survival skills? Who's you know? getting you off the beach? Oh, there's not a lot of guys that fit that bill. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I feel like. Uh, do you have any hunters on the team? Like anybody that can hunt or do anything like that? They like don't need forage? to shoot them. They just need to get them off the beach. No, but well, you still need to know how to prepare food. You know what I mean? Like you can't just, <laughs> anyway. I don't know. I got to go with like one of the older guys. Like a, like a Coburn Watson, Good Branson. I feel like those guys would be able to. Good call. Figure that out. And I can just enjoy the sun, <laughs> sit on the beach and hang out. <laughs> That's yeah. See, I could see Austin Watson being the guy like, I could see him yeah. swimming the entire way from two miles away offshore in to get you. Yeah. And I'd just be sitting on the beach and just, Oh, thanks. Thanks Wally, for bringing me back. <laughs> uh, before we let you go, do you, because this season is so condensed, do you guys pay attention to other divisions? You know what? I was actually talking about this the, the other day is I have, I pretty much the only games I really watch are the North division. And, and of course, Calgary because uh, of my brother, but, Usually all the games we watch are, you know, Toronto, Montreal, Winnipeg, and then the West Coast. I mean, yeah. I mean, especially this year, it's just you had nobody else to really worry about or, or to play. I mean, it's it's fun, of course, watching, you know, Crosby and um, Ovechkin and guys like that and Patrick Kane and um, guys I've looked up to growing up. But um, And, of course, all my buddies that um, I played with, you know, whether at the U.S. program or at uh, BU. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just been pretty much all our focus has been on the North Division and watching all that. I, you do seem to know everybody. Like at some point, I'm going to do a six degrees of Brady Kachuk in the NHL because it seems like there's someone on every team that you know somehow one way or another. It's crazy. There's, there's, yeah, I feel like every team there's always a connection. So that's a lot of money on the board for that one. <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, finally, uh, can, uh, let's, let's get your prediction of who the league MVP is. Whew, that's that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I just think there's so many phenomenal players. I mean, in our division, you got McDavid, you know, Matthews, and um, and you see, you know, back in the U.S., you see, you know, Kane lights out, Crosby's as hot as anybody right now. I mean, just there's so many great players that I mean, anybody, uh, a lot of those guys deserve it. So um, you know, who knows who's going to get it? But um, there's a lot of sweet talent out there. Plus, we just put him on the spot because he's not so paying political. attention to the rest of the NHL. Yeah. So <laughs> political. So, uh, so he just – it's like, who, who, what all-stars can I think of off the top what, of what, guy, what guys have I seen just on my phone that have been playing with all <laughs> <laughs> uh, And is there one defenseman – I know you probably won't uh, answer this because you don't want to give anybody any inf- uh, ammo, but is there one defenseman you hate to play against in the NHL? Hmm. There's a lot of them, but – <laughs> um you know, i don't know there's there's a lot of really good players that are pretty strong and don't let me get to the net so um yeah i mean there's a list of that that i don't like playing against all right that's fair it's a safe um, answer. So. we will uh we'll let you go but we appreciate uh you stopping by and we'll always be looking out and watching over you at all sends games from here on out and hope that the streak can can continue for a while anyway brady thanks for stopping by Thanks for having me, guys. That was a blast. All right, welcome back to the show. Pleased to be joined now by Andre Turney, who just signed a deal to coach every team in Canada in one year. That's right. So welcome to the show, Bear. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you, uh, Wally. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Now, I should say you two know each other very well. You had to coach him for a year with the Ottawa Senators, so... Maybe take this time right now before we get to all the exciting news of your coaching uh, foray, and that is, what was Meth like as a player? Well, Meth was, uh, <laughs> boy, he's a low-maintenance guy. He's a guy who was doing his business, was, uh, the, was uh, the, the guy who was protected by Carlson on top of it. Eric, he loves his Meth, and he did want to play with Meth a lot. So, no, but uh, he was uh, low-maintenance do all about his business and yeah, he had a good presence, the locker room, smiling and all of it. So it was, uh, was, uh, really coachable. And now there's a thing they say about hockey players, whether they're like a five tool player or not, how many tools would you say meth had? <laughs> well, he, he was, uh, a matter of fact, first, first time I, uh, met was hurt to, 
I know it's rare for Matt to be hurt, but he, he did not start the training camp. And at some point, he jumped on the ice and he was flying. Such a good skater with size. I said, those, I said to the coach, I said, this guy's unbelievable. So they say, they, they say skating and size and everything was unbelievable. So he had the size, he had the speed. For, for his role, he had, he had skill. Yeah, I'm not saying. See, I was running the park. I did not have a lot of meeting with that. But I mean, in, in, in his role, he, he, he had a, the, the set of skill he needed. Uh, he, had, he had a good, good read of the game as well. So he, he had a lot of tools to play in his role. That's why he had a long career like that. But he uh, was always broken, though. He was always hurt somewhere, Matt. What's going on? Yeah, a lot of bumps and bruises, but you know what? I appreciate the nice comments, Bear. Thanks, brother. Yeah. No, that's now, uh, that's true. That uh, all the tools uh, were really good. Now, okay, so Beth, let me ask you then about Bear, and that is every team has a good cop, bad cop type assistant coach. So, yeah, as we can see, Bear's got a little sense of humor. Was he the good coach, if you will, the good cop? Well, he worked with the forwards, right? He touched on that. And obviously I never came close to the power play. So I never got to experience Bear in a power play meeting, but no, he was very good communicator, easygoing guy. I know his role is a lot different now that he's the big dog and he's the head coach. You can't necessarily be the buddy, buddy with all the guys. Uh, you know, you, the role changes a little bit, but he was always from my, my recollection, a very good communicator and the guys all loved him. So all good memories for me, at least. All right, Bear, let's get to then now. Uh, you have now are going to be coaching the world junior team. You're going to be coaching assistant coach with the world championship team. And then the following year, you're going to once again, be the head coach of the world championship team all in within a year you're signing. I've never heard of this signing a one year deal to coach the national program. So can you take us through how this deal came together? It came really quick. Uh, to be honest, the, after the world junior, uh, someone from hockey Canada, which is Tyler Dietrich, uh, told me they were talking about that kind of a position and my name come up, but it, it stayed there and time passed and uh, started to negotiate. My, my deal is it was up with the, the, the 67, but with the pandemic, we, we waited a little bit to know what, uh, what can look like. And uh, sort mm -hmm. of started negotiation with, with the 67s uh, took a week or two and I received a call from, from Hockey Canada while I was negotiating and uh, it was Al Miller and he told me, he said, do you, uh, that's the position, you hear about it, uh, will you have interest? I said, yeah, but I, I don't know the length of the contract, the money in the contract, the job description, I, I don't know really. Say, you, will you have interest, Coach Team Canada? Well, yeah, but what it is exactly, you know, so I, I did not know exactly and uh, they, they told me, Monday or Tuesday, uh, Scott Samuel will call you. So, okay, fine. Uh, Scott talk, call me and Scott, for the people who know Scott, no, yeah, there's no, it, it's really quick. It's straight yeah. to the point and say, hey, Bear, that's what we're thinking. That's the position. That's the job description. That's the money in there. That's the term. What do you think? I said, yeah, it's interesting. I said, let me look at it i said that uh, the 67 made a, a really good uh, offer i need to think about it and uh, we'll get back to you tomorrow not in a week tomorrow so i talked to james boys after that J james is my partner he's my friend so i said boy i said you know i want to stay long term with the 67 but here that's what's coming it's unbelievable with the hockey canada what a what the opportunity and everything so he's the one who had the idea i said what about if you do one year deal with Hockey Canada, and during that time, Mario can coach the team. He, uh, he has the competence and everything. And after you come back with the sixty-seven, I say, "Wow!" I say, "Yeah, that will be unbelievable." But now I have to convince sixty-sevens <laughs> and uh, and Hockey Canada to be on a shorter term. So again, call Scott Salmon. Uh, first, I met in the morning at eleven. Uh, Mark Gotti, our CEO, with the uh, the uh, the 67s and then ask him say what do you that's what's going on what do you think mark if i talk to scott salmon and ask him for a one year deal will it be possible so mark said you know what he said i think so he said i don't see why it could not work he said i rather that than you leaving so he said listen let, let me let me think about it see what 
how we can make it happen. And with Mario, let me talk to uh, our partners and uh, obviously James, and we'll get back to you. So, okay, so I have at 1 p.m. this afternoon, I have a call with Scott Salmon. So at 1 p.m., calls Scott, talk to him about one year deal. Scott, yeah, no problem. That's, that's good for us. That makes sense. Understand the situation, understand the opportunity you have with the 67th. It's good for us. All good. So he said, well, I call you tonight for the detail on the contract, the judge, the, the paperwork and everything. I said, okay, good. Then call Mark Gotti back and I say, Mark, Hockey Canada is in. I say, okay, we're in as well. So let's, uh, let's do the final touch on the, the details and everything on the 67th contract. So it happened in the span of three hours. Boom, That's everything crazy. was done. That's crazy because yeah. I also yeah. meant to uh, meant to mention that you also signed a six year deal to coach the Ottawa sixty seven. So the question is, right. how do you split your time? Do you gonna do you plan to sleep? Well, how is this gonna work? <laughs> I, I I don't sleep much. <laughs> I don't lose time with that. But the, no, see, the, this year Mario will be in charge. Will be the ben, the bench the bench boss. Uh, I will be around. My, my office will be the same one. and will be at the same desk. I will we'll work from there. But obviously, uh, my job will be scout the NHL for the World Championship and the Olympic. Scout the junior for the World Junior. So I will be on the road a lot. I will have a lot of planning to do, a lot of logistic. I will have to go in Beijing, see this, the, the site and everything and planning everything. I will go in Europe to do some pre-scout for... Uh, the Olympic, the other national team of the four nation, the five nation tournaments, so those kind of stuff. So I will be uh, on the road a lot, but the rest of the time I will be with the 67s. I will be there every day. So I will be around the player. I will be around the coaches. So uh, uh, it's important for us to keep the same culture, to keep the culture going, but I will not be the one behind the bench. It's interesting. I, I meant to bring up earlier as well, your coaching, assistant coach for the Beijing games. I, I guess that's got to be, is that the, the best thing about this whole thing is be able to do the Olympics. Oh yeah. It, it, you know, all of it, it's unbelievable, Yeah. but the Olympics is, is, is you know, how, how many do a list of who you think will coach the, uh, the Olympic for Canada. You, you will arrive with a list of uh, what, five, six, seven guy, something like that. And how we'll have the chance to be with those guys. You know, I will be, it's unbelievable. It's uh it's a dream come true. I will be with an unbelievable coach. I will learn from them. I will be with the best player in the country. I will have a chance to exchange with them, laugh with them, uh, learn with them, uh, compete with them, sweat with them, all of it. So that will be unbelievable. And the management team, you know, the, all those GM Ken all and Doug Armstrong and um, Don Sweeney, you know, all of those guys that will be, we, we will have a, uh, a lot of discussion about player evaluation and everything, how we want to build a culture of our team and how we want to do things. So that will be uh, on the, the personal level and the development side, it will be unbelievable for me. So uh, all in all, it's uh, just uh, can't believe I can't believe what happened. Uh, now I will say that meth has gone to a couple of world championships and so have yeah. I. So I'm just wondering if meth, do you have some advice for perhaps the next head coach of the world championship team in 2022. <laughs> I'm not in a position to be handing out coach advice. All I know, and I'm sure bear already knows this for being around the NHL, probably just, just having discussions with the leadership group. So you avoid where the players are going in that first week after practices, right bear. So yeah, you guys yeah. can go to a different watering <laughs> hole from the rest of the team, yeah. right? Exactly. That's uh, that's really important. That's will be the first thing. But with the COVID, we never know, man. You know what True. I mean? You, you, I, that's uh, I don't know. We, we might have to share a table. To... <laughs> <laughs> Matt always brings the best advice. All right. I have one quick question on the on the 67s. And that is, is it still tough to look back at the last year and know that you had such a good team and weren't able to see if you could win that Mem Cup or did you get over it pretty quick? Uh, no, I, I think it, it's tough, but it will be even worse when, when you restart, you know, Matt, Matt play, you play for a long time. How many time you really had a chance to win? Really? Yeah, just, you, just one. Yeah. There you go. 
you know? So it's same thing for me. I coached for a long, long time. How many times I had a real chance to say, yeah, this year we have a, we have, we're legit chance to win. Every year you hope to win. Every year you, you hope to compete. You, you, you never know. But in reality, where you say, okay, we're, we're in driver's seat here. We have a real chance to win. It doesn't happen a lot. But it's a, in a lifetime, it's a few opportunities. So um, that was one of those. That's uh, unfortunate. I think junior players don't really realize that. They, uh, I remember even the pro, I, I had discussion with Alex Tange one day, and he, he, was, he played a thousand games when he was in Colorado already. So he, he was a veteran. And we were talking about how about that about a young player that don't realize how fast it is, how, how fast their career goes, and as well, how many chances they will really have to win? Not not a lot. And Tange, Tango won the Stanley Cup his first year. He scored two goals in Game Seven, if you remember. And he thought, "Huh, that's NHL. That's no big deal, baby. That uh, that will be a fun 15 years." And 15 years later is the only final he played in pro, I think. Yeah. So yeah. It, that's what it is. So uh, it, when you you get older, when you get the white uh, beard, you start to realize, okay, it, it, it doesn't happen every year that you have a chance to, to go all the way. Okay, before we let you go, one final question. And that is, your nickname's the bear. So if you were a real bear... Would you be a black bear, brown bear, grizzly bear, polar bear, or teddy bear? That depends about the situation. I can be all of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes I can be the grizzly bear. But, you know, like with Matt, he was playing PK. was not playing in the power play. I was more the teddy bear. But with some guys on the power play, I was more the grumpy bear. So it depends about the situation, you know? Perfect. Hey, Andre, we wish you all the best. We look forward to seeing you behind the bench. And good yeah. luck at the Olympics and, of course, the championships and everything you're doing with Team Canada. And uh, let's hopefully see you at the Memorial Cup here at some point with the Ottawa 67s as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. I love the plan. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Thank you, guys. All right. Welcome back to the show. We do apologize for some of the technical issues in the attorney interview, but we have found out that meth has failed to feed the hamster that works the internet. So uh, we'll uh, make sure that it's taken care of in the next show. But now, Greg stopping by for a little bit of You Want Answers. Greg, what do you got for us? You Want Answers. It's blowing up. We got a bunch more questions today. Uh, they were great last week. So that's why we went uh, right back to it again for, for episode number seven. Um, and let's get right into it. Okay, we'll, we'll start with one for Mark. Uh, I like this one. Uh, it's a known fact that you went to De La Salle, uh, which is an artistic school. What is slash was Mark's artistic talent that got him into that school? Okay, so that's <laughs> somewhat complicated, but I don't want to stretch this out any longer than it has to. I went to a exclusively French elementary school with a lot of very intelligent people in my class, and they all decided to go to De La Salle when we graduated out of grade eight. So I naturally followed everybody. I had no business going to that school. I still remember struggling big time at that school because I was probably one of the only athletes in grade nine and 10 when I went to Derasad. So I, I quickly realized I didn't belong there anymore. So as I graduated into junior hockey, I got away from Derasad and ended up going to Brookfield High School here in Ottawa. So Derasad was very good to me in a way, but um, the school, the classes itself, not so much. So they haven't retired weird. your jersey. <laughs> you know what? They got a pick. They have a little like uh, eight by ten article of me. I guess when I made the transition to the NHL, and they have it hung up there in the gym area. But it's not the best picture, so we can we can. Don't you have it. a you couple must... of extra glossies you can take over now? <laughs> I, I'm tempted to, but I'm also just very uncomfortable. Excuse me, uncomfortable going back to that school because it was an advanced French school, and I spoke English most of the time. So I had a hard time there for a little while. You must have felt like a beast if, there, if it's a bunch of art and music and stuff, and then one <laughs> big athlete walking around. You must no, have been big man on campus, though. So. I was just an awkward, quiet young man okay. in high school. It took me I was a late bloomer. We'll put it that way. Okay, perfect. All right, we're going to move on to uh, number two here. And this one, sorry, that first one came from uh, Church of Alfie, at Praise Alfie. Pretty good name, so we make sure we read that. This one actually comes from Danny Stuckless, and uh, he has two questions, so we'll kind of run through them both here. Um when you're on the road and playing against friends or former teammates, do you find the time to meet up? 
And um, also, this is, I guess, for both of you guys, but uh, why do hockey players use the word obviously so much during interviews? So why don't we do that first one there uh, on the road? I'll let Wally, I'll let okay, Wally yeah. answer the obviously thing first. Yeah, for sure. It's not just obviously. It's like so or I mean so. You know, you know. They, right? They have – everybody just has crutches when they're uncomfortable doing interviews. Like Mike Fisher would always answer every one of his answers with so. And he used to always pull on his sweater. You can actually see him just go, and so. And it would just end. We're like, okay, we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> but I remember doing a sit down with Wade Redden. And I think it was like a, I don't know, maybe a 15 second clip. Maybe it was a little longer, but I wrote it out and brought it to him. He had said, I mean, like 15 times. And I'm not exaggerating. So I'm like, do you want to perhaps redo this? He's like, let's go redo this right now. So we actually redid the interview uh, just because he realized and he changed after that because he saw the crutch of using I mean. But don't forget, a lot of these guys come from Europe or they're French with different backgrounds, right? Of different languages. And so they get uncomfortable and trying to speak in a second language and they end up having sometimes crutch words. And obviously he's one of them. Obviously. Well, yeah. And, and, and I'm glad you're kind of defending the players a little Wally, because people also got to realize we don't have media experience. I mean, it's one thing to sit at home and suggest you can do a better interview than a player on TV, but when you're doing it on live television in front of thousands of people, sometimes for some players, nerves play a role, right? So they use crutches. I well, Let's not forget, Matt, like if you're in a, it used to be, if you're in the playoffs and you're in the locker room, the scrums around you, there's like 30 people staring oh, at you, brutal. waiting for you to give some articulate, eloquent answer. Sometimes yeah. there isn't any answer, right? And so you're searching yeah. for words. Like that is a daunting thing to be surrounded and you're just pinned there to answer these questions right and sometimes when a reporter or a journalist is teeing up a question they're basically answering the question for you in yeah. that question so then like you just said you're scrambling for words and you don't know what to say anyway I, yeah, because uh, I the answer it, sometimes the answer is yes yeah, like, exactly did you really feel player, like tonight's game you should have won three two because you did this yes yeah and okay. you feel like you have to fill the air with words as a player yeah. sometimes, and it gets very complicated. But to touch on the first part of that question on the road, uh, you know, some guys are much more social. I'm more of a hermit. So I like to, I'm, and I'm so routine oriented. So I like to go do my own thing, grab dinner, go back to the room, watch a movie. That was my routine. I was always that way. Uh, but a lot of guys do make it a point to, you know, reach out to a player and have dinner with them and go back home. That's a pretty common thing. Do former teammates just not hit you up when they know you're in town because you'll probably blow them off or? Depends. No, <laughs> no, depends how close you are. You know, like if it's a really, you know, because there's different levels. Some guys were more, you know, you're friendly with them. You remember playing with them a little bit, but maybe not close enough to go have a one-on-one -on -one dinner with them. But there were some players that I played with that in a, in a heartbeat, I would join them for dinner. And, you know, that list is a lot smaller. And when you have an opportunity to meet up with them, you'll do it. Perfect. Okay, let's move on to number three here. And this comes from uh, Joe Roach at RuneDocs on Twitter. Uh, we're going back to more kind of road meal story stuff here. Uh, what's the best meal that you've had in an NHL city? I'll let Wally answer that one first. Oh, I got to well, think about it. I got a couple of stories. One is before Bell bought TSN way back, we used to have expenses. So we could go eat wherever we wanted to. And I was young and dumb. And we would go to like Ruth's Chris or Morton Steakhouse on the road great food but we go to ruth's chris in philadelphia one time my cameraman dave and i and we've never been there so we don't know about the ordering system anyway we order our steak comes we're like where's the rest of it and we didn't know he had to order a la carte so then by oh. the time right, oh. so, so now they're like well that's all you ordered i'm like what about the potatoes they're like we well, didn't yeah. order any <laughs> so so finally we have our meal order asparagus and all that stuff and then get our bill and it's three hundred dollars and I can remember leaving the restaurant and calling our production manager going, listen, I'm sorry. We just had a $300 meal. I apologize. I'm terrified. I'm about to get fired. Anyway, they said, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I find out later that everybody's doing it. It's no big deal. <laughs> so that was always one. But in Vegas, before Vegas was an NHL city, they had the award show there. And they used to really, they used to take care of us a lot. So Darren Drigger and I ended up at a restaurant at uh, Encore or the Win. I think it was, I think it was the Win. And it was a private menu. And so they just brought us the food from the chef and it was phenomenal. I'll never forget that one as long as I live. And we didn't yeah. have to pay a, a penny. So that was even better. Yeah, I can relate to, I can relate to Wally's story there about the price point. Once you're at the <laughs> NHL level, it's, it's a different animal. And uh, sometimes I feel like it would make most people puke. But anyway, I, I know I almost puked a couple of times. I, 
for me, I guess my, I'll want to be specific here. My favorite restaurant on the road was probably Carbone in New York. And you needed a reservation like months ahead to get into that restaurant. So we had to get a hold of Rick Nash, who at the time was playing in New York. And he got a rezzo for four of us there. And it's a really old school, authentic Italian kind of, you know, like massive mm. chicken parm and whatnot. Um, and then any kind of seafood I can find. So when we were playing Boston in the playoffs, they always had these unbelievable lobster rolls at these random little yep. seafood spots. You know what I mean, Wally? So yep. for me, like anything that's kind of culturally exclusive to those cities, I think I would gravitate towards anything that you could get that wasn't in Ottawa, which isn't really hard to beat. But yeah, those two, those two, I guess, places were probably my favorite places to eat. Local. Well, one of the problems, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Matt, I want to bring up like you guys can't really go to the Union Oyster House or whatever in Boston, right? Like because of there being it's a cramped area and you don't want to be caught out right at night with right photos and cameras. So you kind of all have to stick together and be at a high end place where you're left alone. It's what I've yeah. always noticed that you yeah. actually have to be protected from going out and experiencing some of that stuff that we get to do just because of who you guys are. I've noticed that yeah. a lot. On the and way. I was always jealous because it's the media guys were always able to just like, they could go party a little bit. When right. I say party, oh, yeah. go have beers at a pub somewhere <laughs> and like a, like a really old school pub or, and we were always envious of that. Cause you know, I got to go to dinner and make sure I'm eating something relatively healthy for the next day and, you know, have a glass of wine, but make sure I'm drinking water. And I got to be back at a certain time. Whereas the media guys are all, talking about it in the morning and laughing about their evening together it's just yeah that drove me nuts <laughs> all right so i will give it so you're speaking of boston it made me think of the worst hangover I've ever had in my life is <laughs> we are staying for the outdoor game so it's new year's day fenway park uh flyers i think it's 2010 and we're at the fairmont battery wharf which is a beautiful hotel but there's absolutely nobody staying there because it's new year's eve and uh, they all, so we're into the gold club lounge and we're staying in that particular building and it's beautiful. And like, even the Jenga pieces are high end Jenga. Cause I remember playing <laughs> with Dave. Anyway, we have drank so much free wine. So I get up in the morning. I think I'm feeling good, ready to go come down for breakfast, go back up. I can't, I'm, I'm now paralyzed in my bathroom. I'm at the toilet. I can't, I'm worst I'm feeling in the world. Yeah. So I'm trying to get it together. The only thing at the green monster that day was me. So <laughs> We, we go to the game and I remember putting my head down uh, in the cafeteria kind of thing, which is behind where the media sits to watch the game. I woke up with the stat sheet across my face after the first period. I totally missed the first period. <laughs> no idea what happened. Yeah. Did, did nobody see you? Like, do you not no, get uh, reprimanded for this? No, no, <laughs> no. But I, because I laid on my hands and my arms, you, the whole red, my face is just lines of red oh yeah oh that's, that's great that's oh. the longest day of my life also they yeah, the u.s national olympic team that day and so i'm sitting through this at the end of the game so it's another hour on top i just i couldn't wait for that day to be over yeah i, I believe it yeah Man, look at these fan questions look what they're doing oh we get <laughs> drunk wally stories i love it okay uh we got two left here this one comes from at seds red men uh who is the mouthiest player uh you've played oh. against on the ice that's easy for me. For me, it was, well, I mean, there were a lot of guys. Some guys like to talk a lot. So uh, you had the friendly guys, the friendly tough guys that would give you a heads up when they were coming near you. And that was always a lot of fun. But the mouthiest, like of a player that I hated would have been Alex Burroughs. When he was playing with Vancouver and I was in Columbus, the amount of shit talking that would go on between the two of us was insane. Like, and, and like gutless comments, you know what I mean? Like really cut to the core dagger in the back comments and we had we had a serious hate on for each other so i can't think of another player that i disliked more than alex burrows and he stole my watch when <laughs> i was at the world championships which, I'm gonna which go has back never before we get sued has never been proven Allegedly. Um, <laughs> i know Allegedly. And burr burr i'm joking we because okay, for people that don't know we did end up playing together in the end and we got along great but he's a highly competitive guy and i respected that so it's all did, good. But did, did he get in your kitchen? Like, would you admit to him being in your head? Uh, the odd comment for sure, because, and I've spoken on this with, with BX, like we, I was always at it with the, with the Sedins and Burr yeah. played on the line with them. Right. So we were running and he was a right winger. So we were running into each other all the time and it got physical and we never really fought. We'd get into scrums and punches to the head with our gloves on around the net, but we never fought. We were, neither of us were really fighters, but we hated each other. So 
Yeah, I mean, good competitive stuff, though, right, Wally? <laughs> right. <laughs> Brent, did I you just ever like do the a... fact the two of you were ended up being roommates at the World Championships for like five years. Yeah, that I is think funny. That's the yeah, so we'll weird, bring him right? on. I, I, I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to bring on. him on sometime for. Yeah, but guess, I don't know. He's he's a he's a coach now, so he might be too cool for that. I will see. Okay, Brent, did you, you ever do any? Did you do any between the glass stuff like between in games? I'm pretty sure you did, right? Like in a game. No, no, no. So one? I tried, and I, I mean, Andre Wall would have probably been the biggest yapper I can remember, especially yeah. for an Ottawa Senator. Martin Havlat was a pretty yappy little guy. Like he used to drive players crazy. He started a brawl in Philadelphia. Like that's what, <laughs> like he really drove people nuts. But I, I think probably Andre Wall would have been one of the yappiest guys. Yeah. I think, I think we had, a, I still remember a moment. I played with another yapper and it was Derek Dorsett. And I still remember being in Columbus playing against uh, Boston. Was Mark Greckey still in Boston at the time? When was he still playing? I think he, he was just about to retire when we were there as rookies. And I remember Dorset yelling at Mark Recchi on the ice, let the kids play old man. Or he said something <laughs> like that, screamed it. And one of the vets on our team tapped Dorset on the side and says, you can't say that. Like, that's just, that's offside. Don't say that to him. Like, as in this guy's earned his respect. No, yeah. it wasn't Mark Recchi. Oh my gosh. It could have been, was it a Ginla? I'm mixing up my players now. And this story was in Boston nowhere. too though. Yeah, I think it was Recky, and I think it was in an exhibition game. And I was it was hilarious because you got this young pigeon yelling at a player, <laughs> like like a Hall of Famer, and and he was put in his place right around the bench by his own teammate. So I thought that was a, a learning moment yeah, for a, a lot one. of us on the bench. Yeah. Okay, we we got one left here, and this one comes from uh, Matthew Lizotte, and uh, the question is that uh, he'd like to hear about the moment that you realized that you actually made it in your profession. So, Matt, that'd be when you realized you were an NHL player, and Wally, when you were uh, like a, when you were a legit broadcaster, uh, and that you felt kind of uh, complete about it. You were sh confident in yourself to call yourself that. Uh, can't be the first game you've ever played or the first interview because that'd be way too easy. Sure. Wally, you go ahead. Oh, this is, I, you know what? I never really felt like I made it, um, which was always odd, but I never, I never did. I will say though, that I got to cover. So when you're, when you are the reporter chosen to, to cover the biggest story that's going on, then you kind of feel like perhaps they, they like me. So the steroid hearings on Capitol Hill with baseball were one of my favorite things I've ever covered and they could have sent anybody to do it or uh, Stanley cup finals uh, covering Olympics, but like covering the 2004 05 lockout was was one of those where you just where you were sent in uh, to be the guy to cover the biggest story. Uh, and a lot of times nothing was going on. But so night after night and day after day, you're just standing on street corners in New York, waiting and waiting. One day they are at meeting at our hotel. Now, normally you weren't allowed to have cameras in hotels in the lobbies unless you were staying there. So we were fine. We just stayed in the lobby and we're like, no, no, our room is upstairs and all that stuff. So my cameraman, it's now like six or seven in the morning. We haven't slept all night. We just ordered coffee and sat on the couch. He goes, I, I got to I gotta go to the can. As he goes to the can, Ted Saskin, Bill Daly, everybody walks out of the hotel. Lockout is over. We have now missed the lockout <laughs> because my camera guy needed to do number two. So <laughs> That's brutal. I'll, I, I'll never, I just remember my jaw dropping watching these guys just walk by. I'm like, Hey guys. Anyway, so what 20... was what was the what was the conversation you had with your cameraman after that? I said, nothing, right? What do you say? Like, did you wash your hands? Yeah. There's nothing left. I so guess I you pack yeah. up and you, you head. Good down on you. The... Good on you yeah. for not getting angry. That's yeah, Matt. Good Matt before we get to yours, there, uh, Wally. What was the? Did you see any crazy stuff? If you were just hanging out in New York streets all 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 the time, like, did you see any? The people oh. watching must have been superb. I, you know what? It ended up becoming at the end. We would always see people we thought looked like other people. So oh, we'd right. always be like, oh, that looks like so, or is that today's version of Gary Bettman, whatever it okay. like there wasn't so much because you just got tired of standing there. And, and in the middle of February, it's so cold. Oh, we right. rented a taxi to sit there. And I think we spent like two hundred and some dollars. It just hours. We just had the car running like so. Wow. It's not a lot. Like we used to just give out directions. People would go, hey, you know where this is? I'm like, yeah, it's three blocks over and two blocks up like. <laughs> but that's it, I mean, it's one of those things you'll never forget, but I don't ever want to go to an Oban pan because that's where we always spent all our time trying to plug in our phones for our Wi-Fi and get coffee. But anyway, nice. it, was, I, it was one of those things you'll never forget as long as you okay. live for sure. Matt, what about you? When did you realize that you were an NHL defenseman? 
uh, my, was it my third year pro maybe, or my first year going into like after my entry level, I think it was, I think it was my third year pro. Um, I uh, was at Columbus training camp and I had done an interview with Aaron Portsline, their beat reporter there. And we had a long discussion about where I was at organizationally speaking on the depth chart. And I still remember saying Columbus, if they don't want me good riddance, I'll go somewhere else. And that was my quote in the newspaper. Oh, no. the next day. So I still <laughs> remember guys like Frederick Modine and some of the veterans that were there the next day, like riding the bike, looking at the newspaper and looking at me walking in and go, Oh, you know, that was bold, eh, Matt? And I thought, you know, what are you talking about? And I remember re reading the article after and thinking, oh God, but the best thing that could ever happen to me, because it basically just like invigorated me to play my, play my lights out during training camp to the point where they had no choice, but to keep me at camp. And even Scott Housen, the GM at the time, admittedly said, he's like, you know what? I respect the confidence and you know, he's, he's motivating himself and this and that. And he kind of played it off. I think he did more a little damage control than anything else. But um, I still remember saying that. And, and it, it's the, the feeling. I still remember the feeling I had. The, it was almost like the shock, maybe a little bit of embarrassment and regret at the time when it was posted in the paper. But it worked out to my advantage in the end because I that was one of the best training camps I've ever had in my career. Perfect. Hey, you wanted answers. We got answers and then some today. So that was a good one. That's great stuff, Craig. Uh, we'll look forward to doing it again. Uh, just questions for Meth next time, because I don't know if I can tell any more hungover stories. <laughs> any more war um, stories. Yeah, really. But if we can get any questions that makes Meth do a Ken Hitchcock impression, uh, we'll just put those in okay. every time. Oh, right? I, hey, I love Hitch. Okay. I love <laughs> Hitch. I don't want to be, I don't want this to be like an Aaron Portsline style situation where it's used against me. Okay. Uh, you're uh, no, it's absolutely fine. We I just like your impression. There, Everybody, Fair hey, enough. everybody, yeah, no, it's it's gold. Okay. <laughs> He'll never see this show. It's only for our friends and family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> time now. Let's get to Trivial Trivia presented by gongshow.com. Once again, our good friends at Gong Show have given us the sauce-off game to give to the winner of today's question. This prize, simply amazing. Meth summer, right around the corner, ultimate backyard hockey game. It's perfect for the cottage, road trips, tailgates, or playing in the driveway. And as always... A huge thank you to Gong Show. Craig, what's the question? Perfect. Well, before that, on Thursday, uh, we got to give one away first, right? So on Thursday, we asked, what was Kenzie Lalonde's favorite treat at Quitter's Coffee in Sitzville? Of course, the answer, like most of us, uh, uh, she enjoys the scones there. Uh, so shout out to everybody, but particularly at Harvey Brian on Twitter. Uh, Brian will be reaching out pretty soon. Um, but that brings us to today's question. So we have another sauce off game on the line. Rewind back to Brady Kachuk interview. Which roommate did Brady Kachuk say naps a lot? He likes his naps. Who is it? Okay. Send us your answers on Twitter uh, and use the hashtag Wally Mathot. Contest closes on Wednesday at noon and we will reveal the winner on Thursday show. All right. Good stuff as always, Craig. Appreciate it. And again, our show next is on Thursday. And if you like some of what we're doing, perhaps just like and subscribe us on our YouTube channel, if you wouldn't mind. Also, you can find us on podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, and Google. Now, before we go, Matt, I want to go back to something you said earlier about the practice in Ottawa that Adam Foote ran. I can tell you the next game, you guys won 3-2 in a shootout. Adam Foote named second star of the game. That's pretty good. That's right? awesome. And and. I like my, my memory of the game is so jogged. I probably wasn't even playing it. I was probably a scratch, but you were. Uh, that was for, that was footer though. In a nutshell, like just an unbelievable leader. And actually not just him, Pekka as well. Like he was the, the, between the two of them, like they weren't shy to speak up when they had to. So none of this surprises me. Um, what, do, and, what does surprise me though, Sergey Fedorov was playing on the team that I always forget that he played in Columbus. He did score in that game. Uh, we got to go. I appreciate your time as always, and uh, we'll see you on Thursday. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show.